I'm really pleased to introduce Howard. Um, Actually, we can't hear you at all. Can you can't? You? Okay. That's fine. If we have to be able to Okay. Holding. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm well, Greg. Also, sorry, before you do that, just a practical thing, because there's two, this is a half an hour session. Um, these guys will decide on when mm -hmm. it gets to take questions. Oh, yeah, and we'll be taking them up. My name's Greg Zachary. I'm the author of a biography of Vannevar Bush, um, and I uh, spent a good deal of time in the book discussing Doug Engelbart's connection and inspiration of Bush, and uh, I'm pleased to introduce Howard, who was an inspiration to me, uh, as, as, as to Frody and others. His Tools for Thought is a landmark book, and um, I started my own book a few years after I read his, and uh, it influenced me a great deal about the potential for mind amplification. Uh, John Markoff couldn't be here. He's been taking a lot of time off from work to promote his book, Machines of Loving Grace, and those bean counters at the New York Times, noting his large number of absences in recent weeks, actually have been asking him to do work I've been counseling him on this. It's very traumatic for him uh, to be reminded that he is an employee of a profit-making corporation. And, uh, but, but he has tremendous affection for, for Howard, uh, and, and we both do, and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm essentially a stand-in for Howard. Uh, mm -hmm. His work uh, is just enormously important. He's both an original thinker and a popularizer, he has popularized some of his own original ideas, which is a very envious position to be in. He's a deep thinker, but also uh, works in the vernacular, is very fluent, and is very much a, uh, someone who absorbed a lot of cultural and technological influences um, that uh, came in his midst. So um, I thought what I would do is uh, if there are questions as we discuss, you know, pipe in or raise your hand and we'll join in because it's not really um, easy to uh, interview or, or try to be a foil for Howard. He's a protean thinker. He swarms subjects and moves uh, all over the place very, very quickly. So, I, I, and I also want to want to be mindful that that for some of you. Uh, John's affectionate, avuncular style of interviewing, which is not my own, um, will be missing. Uh, so, um, you know, I just thought I would, I would just kick, kick this off with a, with a couple of questions. And one from our conversation yesterday about social media. In many ways, whether it was virtual communities uh, or the well, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, subjects that you've written about of how digital media connected people, um, we're now seeing some of the unintended consequences of this. Uh, much to our surprise, uh, a bunch of people in Syria seem to be so good at social media that our own Department of Defense, which is of course a trailblazer in social media, filled with very intelligent people, are flummoxed by what these folks are doing. Did you ever imagine that virtual communities, which you extolled as beneficial and as human enhancing, could be subverted into whatever it is they are blamed for now? Well, there's actually a couple of questions in there. Um, first of all, I've, I have I will take the hit, but a lot of people use me as an example of a technology enthusiast, which I am, but did they not read the last chapter? Um, of course, if you're going to amplify the capabilities of humans, some of them are going to have amplified not so good capabilities. Uh, and, you know, uh, I'll circle back to that because I, I think, um, well, my experience is that I counsel people to be very careful about generalizing about how other people ought to live their lives. And there's a lot of alienation and disconnection and distraction and, and bullshit and, and crime um, that, that goes on online. Um, 
there are people for whom that connection is a lifeline. That was true then, it's true now. If you've ever had a life-threatening disease or you're a caregiver for somebody who's got a life-threatening disease, you will not dismiss the whole thing with a, a blanket generalization. So we could parse that if you want. The other question, you were talking about terrorists using media very well. You know, um, it doesn't really pay to be too far ahead in the book game, as I'm sure you know. I wrote a book um, in two, published in 2002 called Smart Mobs um, that was about how um, these mobile telephones were going to connect to the internet and they're going to have cameras in them and people were going to use them to organize collective action. Uh, you know when the Egyptian uh, Revolution and the Arab Spring and many, many, many things happened, um, I, I got a call from one journalist from, from Germany. Everyone else had forgotten that, about that book, but it, it, it really didn't take a genius to see that if people can carry a connection in their pocket to people they don't know but who share a particular interest and that device knows where they are, then things are going to happen in the real world. I, it's a, a, a complicated story. I think that the, the critical uncertainty is obviously, and there's so many examples, there are hundreds and hundreds of examples, including in China, which, which does a really good job of keeping the lid on, of people organizing demonstrations, overthrowing governments, um, starting revolutions, can, people don't seem to be able to use this capability so well to organize lasting movements. And I think that that's the critical uncertainty is it's easy enough to get everybody to show up in the square tomorrow and bring down the government. The next day, your revolution will be hijacked as they always are by some people who really know what they're doing while other people argue about what it is that, that they're there for. Right, that smart mobs was prescient. And you have generally been a visionary about the wisdom of crowds. And we've heard here today the term collective IQ um, invoked. Um, do you see some, having now looked at some of these negative as well as positives, are there interventions that either the engineering community would make, or the policy community, or culturally, that, that might um, strike a different balance between what seems to be a, demon, you know, a, a movement to demonize the internet, to make it seem like it must come under government control, because that's the subtext when uh, the establishment and Wait, the which, which government? The United States government. Okay, and, and how many troops are we going to send to China? Well, no, I'm just... I'm just yeah, I'm just, I'm just saying that do you see a response if we think of, if we think of the community of progressive, um, enlightened people that drove um, the advance of the internet and well, yeah, communication? Yeah, yesterday, um, Donald J. Trump, who's really against all of the stupid people in government, said that he was going to talk to Bill Gates about shutting down the, the, the internet. Um, you know, good. <laughs> Good luck on that. So, um, but, but, but you know, I, I don't, uh, I'm not writing about technology anymore. I'm not really looking at the, the future anymore. But throughout the, what, 30 years we're talking about, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I was a freelance writer uh, out to pay my rent. I wanted to have, you know, I wanted to send words out and have money come in. I did not consider myself a scholar, but all of these academics started writing about all of the problems with the things that I was writing. So, you know, I started paying more attention to, you know, what was going on. I, I'm sorry, I've lost the thread. What was the qu question again? Well. I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what to do about it? So the, the question it. was um, 1985, future of personal computers, 1993, future of social media, 2002, future of mobile media, 
is this stuff, personal computers, networks, um, phones, are, are they any good for us for, as individuals? Or are they corrosive and destructive of communities and society and our ability to think? And I've thought about it a lot because, uh, you know, you, you don't want to spend that much time writing something that's, that's a, a, about um, something that you ultimately abhor. Um, my conclusion is that it depends on what people know and, and how many people know it. This is a hopeful conclusion. I've been accused of optimism, which I am not. I think you know everybody in this room is educated enough to know how terrible humans have been to each other, how they, terrible they're being to each other right now, what's likely to happen tomorrow. But I also know that we are all descendants of some ancestor who said there must be some way out of this impossible situation. And uh, you know, logically, thinking that does not guarantee that you're going to survive. Um, not thinking that pretty much guarantees that, that you won't. So hopefully, maybe the literacy, the cultural norms, the ability to, to determine um, bullshit from good information, um, the ability to make decent judgments in the, in the, in the light of very rapid events that move your emotions, um, maybe that, that can spread. Maybe people can get educated about it. So that was the last book I'm going to write was Net Smart about, you know, you know it, I know it. Wouldn't it be nice if 100 million or a billion people knew some basic things. So I, uh, maybe the word will spread. I, I, I do know that, that um, there are tens of millions of, of teenagers uh, teaching each other very complex video games online right now. It's not that uh, we can't teach each other. It's not that we don't have the means to do so. So maybe. And it's not in school. The role of text within these digital communities. I've been impressed by the strength of path dependence of text. Uh, whether it's sentences, paragraphs, uh, essays, they're persisting and they're repelling uh, very well-organized, uh, well-conceived efforts by mixed media to diminish and dislodge text from its central position in knowledge. Um, what do you think the future of text uh, hey, has. You know, uh, well, uh, you know, we've got Wikipedia and and, and um, we've got um, memes. I mean, every morning there's a there's a new one. You, you don't have a meme without some text in it. It's evolving very rapidly. You know, before we heard, I think it was Bob Stein who talked about how long it took things. Uh, things took longer back then. Um, they're they're evolving more quickly now, and language evolves, and like I said, I, I don't really think about the future so much the way I used to, but I did see one thing that made my spidey sense tingle. It was, um, there's a, a, a graduate student uh, at um, MIT Media Lab who wanted to get young people more involved in electronics, so she made these stickers made out of copper foil that you can you can easily put onto notebook paper and little tiny flat LEDs and little tiny flat speakers and little tiny flat sensors so that they could write a little story and then they could click on the, they could actually put their finger on the word sun and a little light would light up. And you know, somebody uh, who was pretty adept at this made a beautiful little notebook with translucent pages uh, and watercolored overlays of a bay in the San Francisco Bay Area um, with little LED lights in it, and um, through a Wi-Fi connection, it will show you through the, how the lights light up through these beautiful layers of, of watercolor what the tide is in that bay at that moment. And I just I thought, okay, paper and writing and hands and eyes, that's a very old technology. Now we've got um, something that can sense and affect the physical world, and then you've got the connection to the internet with, with the, the knowledge and information and control systems. And it, it, it seems to me that the three of these coming together are going to evolve 
into something. I have no idea what it is, but that, that's the only thing that I would have to add to what everybody has to say today that I have sensed that seems like maybe it's a, a, a little mammal today and it's going to evolve into something. Yeah, yeah, uh, students of mine, because I, I, I teach at Arizona State University, because I, I, I couldn't get a job in California. I didn't have enough attainment. Uh, uh, but um, they tell me at 2021 that they're writing more and that they feel there's a renaissance in writing because of texting, emailing, instant messaging, that they're doing more writing on the fly than they ever imagined. Is it possible that text is repositioning itself, recalibrating itself within this digital landscape so that it's searching for some new permanence within this shape-shifting? Well, you know, without a doubt, what, it's, it's not a zero-sum game. Is, is text going to go away because we have all of these other media and and what is you know can can you um, can you tell someone how to write a constitution um, only with pictures? Okay, maybe, but why? The Bill of Rights and pictures. There's a good idea. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, one other question I wanted to ask you, and then I would encourage people to start interjecting is. Cognitive enhancement, mind expansion. We've mainly been talking about, or only, about digital pathways to enhanced cognition and expressing <coughs> print uh, uh, words through um, phrases through that. Um, we ha and and then to hear someone from Intel say that um, you know we want to get we want to make hardware to improve thinking. I, I thought that was kind of interesting. But it does pit the digital world squarely against the biopharma world. And this biopharma world has crossed over before. I mean, um, according to John Markoff, it's probably not true that people involved in SRI dropped acid. I mean, come on, a tall tale. But you have also the Steve Jobs insistence that uh, you can't understand him uh, unless you dropped acid. And so I do think that the biopharma world has a lot to say about cognitive enhancement. And when do these two worlds collide? And is it possible that because we have digital technology, we won't need to resort to drugs? Well, uh, you know, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I think, I think Scoble is here. Somewhere, didn't I read like two days ago that that um, Anderson Horowitz are, are uh, investing in nootropics, drugs to enhance intelligence? Can I just say, it's it, intelligence is is not the problem. Um, the, uh, the 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 I, I always remember that the um, the officer who led the special action squads who shot Jews in Eastern Europe had two PhDs. So, you know, I think empathy is a, a big issue. <laughs> Questions from the floor to get some of you involved, because some of you know Howard much better than I do on this subject matter, of course, much better than I do, and it would be nice to engage people. Um, Froda. Okay, I'll talk about the little narrow slice that I know about, which is that I taught for 10 years at, at, at Berkeley and Stanford, and I, I started doing it, and they let me do it because it, it was clear to me that the students were immersed in what they now call social media, but none of the college courses were looking at that you can connect to Irving Goffman and sociology, you could look at Sherry Turkle and psychology, there's lots and lots of the texts that in people in different disciplines read anyway, offer ways to think about these things that influence so much of our, our lives. So I felt that it didn't make sense to talk about social media if you didn't use it. So from the beginning, I asked my students to, to blog, to participate in forums, 
to edit wikis uh, together. Um, and the way I ended up explaining why these different media was that the forum was the voice of the group. It was a way that we could carry, every once in a while, you, you have a classroom discussion and it gets exciting and then the bell rings and everybody disperses. We could continue that. Um, there's some issues with that, but sometimes the magic happens and, and the conversation continues. And um, we are each not trying to write little mini essays to impress each other and the teacher, we're trying to have a conversation, and build on what people said previously, that the conversation should be greater than the sum of the, of the posts. The blog, you can have comment threads, you can have discussions in blogs, but you're the person who determines what the subject is. So it's the voice of the group and the voice of the individual within the context of the group, and then the collaborative writing part of it that was very difficult for them because that's called cheating, and they're taught to be very private about their work. Um, that's is probably changing generationally pretty quickly. Uh, when I started, it was wikis, and now everybody uses Google Docs, and I'm told there's something called Quick that's, that people are using instead of Google Docs. So collaborative writing, those are all different textual voices, uh, you know, just one other thing is that I, I just remembered this was um, when Wired Magazine started their, their electronic, their online version, Hot Wired, there was a meeting, um, a kind of intensive meeting, took an hour or two, uh, and the conclusion was we should hire some writer to write a piece that has links in it. And who among us does not have a, a fluency in knowing when and when not to in, include a link in our writing? It's just, it's no big deal. It's part, and that's part of what's happening is, it's not like people run around saying, I'm living in the future. We forget that we didn't used to have hyperlinks and things that we, we wrote. Another issue that comes up in this regard is, in scholarly terms, or even the orth author's prerogative is to freeze text. The text is finished, and one of the, gr you know, we don't go back to say, uh, someone mentioned Phaedrus this morning, and in fact I was going to talk a little bit about that, but it's quite true. Socrates expressed all these uh, reservations about writing, but we don't go read Phaedrus or Shakespeare and find it's different, it's changed, it's been updated, uh, we don't go back and read Dostoevsky or, or Tolstoy and say, wow, there's a new ending. Somebody improved it. So there, are some eth there is an ethos in text culture that honors the finished work. Now, we, we all, Raymond Carver recently, when he died, it turned out that his editor did a lot of changes to his stories, and in particular, a couple of volumes. So they Library of America published the original ones. We're sort of used to that. That's called variance. But we're not used to living text that's constantly changing. And this has been a big challenge for digital approaches to text. Uh, how did you, how do you think about that? Well, you know, back to the students. One thing that I love to, to show the students is there's a, a, a video by um, John Udell in which he followed the Wikipedia entry on the, the umlaut in heavy metal uh, bands, you know, from the first page um, through time. And so you saw this thing expanding and contracting and expanding and, and contracting. The text has never done that before. As a teacher, what I loved was the revision history. Um, and at the beginning of the class, I would, I had asked them to do a shared lexicon. I could show the revision history on the screen and everybody could see who did the work. Uh, well, you know, nobody cares about the revision history, but it's there for the few people who do care. Yeah, no, Sam, let me say one quick thing, which is they may start to care. Increasingly, as text is unhinged from paper frozen versions, we will never know whether in the middle of the night somebody hacked their way through Wikipedia and it turns out everything we thought about World War II is different. One more minute, by the way. Okay. So I'm curious, given that you've written this book and a few years have come by, and I feel like I myself need a little bit of counseling or therapy right now, because 
the tools that I consider having been very useful to me and allow me to do things that other tools don't do have disappeared. Oh, and by these, I mean Living Video Tech, I mean NetManage Echo, I mean Improv, I mean you know Axon 2000, which is I guess still around. But some of the best stuff does not take hold. And yet the stuff that does take hold is this kindergarten stuff. So I'm curious your take on where are these tools for thought are trending in. We have Ted Nelson here. Um, it shouldn't have, you know, the web should not have been the way it is. So things evolve and you don't have control over them. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't know what the solution is. is that that's, you know, the world we live in. Again, this is another issue. I mean, John Markoff, who's not here, makes a big effort that he can read under a, uh, from a current device his notes from back in the 1970s. I mean, he's, but whereas m many of us have earlier documents trapped in formats we can't access, and so this is a little bit like the NASA f photos that they are on drives that can't be used anymore. And so I think that this is gonna be an increasing problem as more and more of our intellectual, textual life is loaded onto digital. Or the cloud, for that matter. What happens when the cloud disappears? I, just, I wanted to uh, just pick up on this, uh, sort of the question of being able to see the revision history question. And I think it's, uh, you know, this, this topic is something, it's, it's, it's so important always to think of, of the use case. Even, even, to go, even to go back to your, uh, your comment about a Bill of Rights in, or a Constitution in pictorial form, well, that's something that might be really useful if you're, like, doing sort of an immigration, immigrant education project where people aren't yet fluent in English and, you know, there, like there might be a use case where something like that is, is useful. And I think like with a, you know, with a document, there might be the more casual reader that has no interest whatsoever, but then someone in the media who's writing a, 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 an in-depth critical piece might explore that and find something really interesting in it. So I, you know, I, I guess I think of it, I'm really curious if you see this, like text I see as the lowest common denominator. It's the thing that it's easiest to change, and I think it always will be compared to video, compared to pictures. So thank you very much.